Good evening, everyone, and welcome to TIFF Bell Lightbox. My name is Brad Dean. I'm the director of the TIFF Cinematheque and programmer for this retrospective of the films of Claire Denis. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to the screening of Trouble Every Day with Angelo Moretta. <clears throat> to begin, we'd like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the, of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are very grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. On behalf of TIFF, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, our public supporters, uh, the uh, Ontario Creates, and the Canada Council for the Arts. As a charitable organization, we'd also like to thank our donors and members for making TIFF's year-round programming, educational, and community outreach initiatives possible. And I'd also like to thank Classical FM Radio and Zoomer Radio, our sponsors for the program. So as many of you are probably aware, if you've probably been attending the, the films in this series, this is our Claire Denis retrospective, and it's going on until the end of the month. So there's a lot of great screenings left. I encourage you to come out for more. Uh, just one note, I'd like to um, address that we've added a screening of Claire Denis' newest film, High Life. It's gonna be screening on March 28th, so it'll give you a chance to see it before it opens in theaters uh, later in April. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to our guest this evening, Angelo Moretta. He is a Toronto-based critic, teacher, and programmer. His writing has appeared in Cinemascope, The Walrus, Now Magazine, and Film, Fre Film Freak Central. Uh, he teaches at Humber College's Media Foundation program, and he is completing a PhD on disability in Canadian literature and film at the University of Toronto. He's also a curator at the Royal Cinema, where he programs the screening series, No Future. Please join me in welcoming Angelo Moretta. Everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Brad, for that lovely introduction. I also want to thank Jessica and Caitlin for being such lovely hosts to me and uh, running interference and wrangling me in a nice way. Um, I spent a lot of time this week trying to figure out sort of where to start with this difficult and opaque and sometimes beguiling film, uh, which always seems to sort of slip out of my grasp just as I think I have a good reading of it. Um, and it occurred to me, because I think I like making things difficult for myself, that one good place to start might actually be with uh, Denis's newest film, High Life, which uh, Bat Brad just spoke about, and which most of you probably haven't seen unless you happen to be uh, one of the lucky audiences uh, at TIFF last fall, but you will, uh, as Brad was saying, get a chance to see it again. Uh, could I actually get the image on the screen? Thank you. Better to look at Robert Pattinson's beautiful HD face uh, while this conversation is ensuing. So a High Life is a film that when it was first announced, um, it got a lot of people excited because it seemed so high concept, but also in some weird way so easy to summarize, I think, the appeal of in bullet points, uh, which is not something that you can typically say of a Claire Denis film. Um, Claire Denis making a sci-fi movie about a penal colony in space, supposedly written by Zadie Smith, although she ended up not writing it, but that's beside the point, uh, and starring Robert Pattinson, right? This is the kind of way people spoke about this film when it was first announced. And I think I think some of that kind of manic, overeager, cinephile meme energy carried over into the breathless way that people tweeted about this movie uh, when that first screening happened uh, at TIFF last fall. And I don't want to be too hard on my colleagues, who I shall not name, who tweeted about the movie in this way. And none of the people I like and I'm friends with did this. So don't, don't think I'm talking about you. This is a subtweet for people I don't know. Um, but. Something about the way people were talking about this movie bugged me before I saw it, and I just knew that, you know, like something is wrong with the way people are talking about this. Um, mostly these first takes offered up a list of disjointed images, uh, sort of emphasized for their punk value. So Juli Juliette Binoche is cupping seminal fluid, and there's some kind of disembodied thing called a fuckbox, and it's really awesome. And, and this is sort of the vibe that people came out of that movie with, which 
it sort of made it seem off the wall and edgy and naughty and punky. And, you know, to some extent, those are terms that you can apply to Claire Denis' films, I think. But I saw the movie a few days later at another screening, and I was struck by how alienated those descriptions were from the movie I actually saw. Um, the movie I saw was not edgy for the sake of being edgy. It was violent, yes, but it was also delicate and tender. Um, yes, there was seminal fluid. Yes, there was a thing called a fuck box. Yeah, they got that right. But that film was grasping, I think, in this tentative and textured and sort of fleshy way of all of Claire Denis' films with a lot of contradictions, with our capacity, even in the future, our seemingly boundless capacity for both joy and, and exploitation, with the human capacity for touch that is both sensuous and damaging. And so despite seeming really sort of graspable and easy to to put into this series of images, uh, despite seeming able to be parsed and filed away and itemized uh, in tweets in this way, I think this movie resonated in a very different way from the way people were talking about it. And that's largely how I feel about Trouble Every Day as well. I think you could say this is sort of the original Claire Denis genre film Modi in the same sort of tradition uh, that High Life follows in. It's a film that you could very well break down in terms of its sort of graphic sequences, its, its tableau. Um, if someone asked you to describe, you know, what does this movie look like, you could certainly do that. You could linger on these graphic images that we associate with the film. So this is one of them. This is one of the most common images that is associated with this film, where we see a woman played by Beatrice Dal, who's you know, drenched in blood, uh, standing in front of this mural of human matter uh, that is of her own making. You know, this is one of the images that certainly comes to mind from this film. You could also think of this image, which I'm sure if you were if you were on Facebook a few years ago and you you are a cinephile or you have a cinephile friend, this was this was somebody's cover photo on Facebook at some point. But this image of Vincent Gallo as this kind of contemporary urban monster in peacoat, uh, pulling faces in front of a couple of gargoyles. Uh, you know, this is another one of those really stark frontal images that people sort of associate with this movie. And you could think of images like this one. This is sort of an evocative, I think, fairy tale image of hands touching each other through a makeshift wooden fence, fence that's hiding another sort of monster who doesn't look like a monster, not unlike Vincent Gallo. Um, there's certainly the temptation with the film that's as elliptical as this one, and that's a word that tends to get stuck to Claire Denis' films a lot, and that's as rich in these bold and beautiful and sometimes quite ugly images as Trouble Every Day to, to sort of linger on these graphic images. But I want to try to resist that temptation a little bit in speaking about the film. I don't want to just reduce it to its edgiest or its biggest and its boldest images. I want to suggest that we also should pay attention to its rhythm its understated way of getting its ideas across, sometimes in quite quotidian and tender images. And I want to suggest that this film's genius and the reason that so many of you are willing to subject yourself to it uh, tonight, despite knowing how difficult it is, um, lies in the way that it marries this graphic sensibility with something that is much more delicate and much more fine-grained, which is also Denise Forte. So what I want to do in the next little bit is just give you a few ways into thinking about this movie. I want to talk a little bit about some of its critical and its genre contexts. And I also want to think about Denis' representation of the body, which is something that a lot of people have talked about. Um, and on that note of the body, I just want to offer a little bit of a content warning for those of you who might not have seen this film before that uh, the film depicts two extremely violent sexual assaults, which I'm going to be addressing toward the end of the talk. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, the film's initial reactions, I think it's pretty fair to say, 
were not so good. People, when they were first talking about this movie, apart from the apocryphal story of people fainting uh, at its screening at Cannes, people were not super enthused about this movie at first. Uh, Variety called it needlessly obscure, which is uh, the kind of thing a lot of American and British critics uh, said about this movie. Uh, Jay Hoberman also wasn't a fan. He said it was dull despite all of its sexual provocations. Agree to disagree. Um, James Quant, who you might know, said in Art Forum that it exhibited most of what he called the worst characteristics of uh, this 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 mode he observed called the new French extremity, which might be a term uh, that you've heard of. Um, those films, to briefly summarize for anyone who either is unfamiliar with this term or you maybe read it in the lead up to this event and were wondering what it was, um, Quant describes them as self-stylized, transgressive art house horror films of the early 21st century made by French directors like Bruno Dumont, Catherine Breillet, Gaspard Noé. Uh, and he called this a strand of shock cinema with philosophical affectations, which is not a compliment in case you couldn't tell. Um, and actually, if you look at Tiff's uh, blog, The Review, uh, they published a great piece from a couple of years ago where Quant revisits this influential piece and sort of, uh, sort of goes over the dead body of that piece. And suffice it to say, he hasn't really warmed too much to trouble every day, but he does regret the way that this label has stuck to Denis to the point where new French extremity is something that often crops up in her biographies, even though I don't think Denis would really see herself as being part of any movement, certainly not that particular movement. People have all the same come around to trouble every day as they tend to do with Denis' more polarizing films. Uh, in 2013, Max Nelson in Film Comment called it uh, a public self-exorcism. He said, it's a painful film rooted in desire and violence that in his estimation, Denis kind of needed to get out of her system in order to depict sexuality in a much more tender and loving way in Vendredi Soir. Reappraising the film a few years ago in The Village Voice, uh, Melissa Anderson called it a, quote, hypnotic and unsettling work by one of the most sensuous filmmakers of the past 25 years. And always with Trouble Every Day's positive critical appraisals, I think you see these hyphenated sorts of descriptions. It's hypnotic and it's sensuous, which is to say it's erotic, but it's also unsettling. It's troubled in the way that the title suggests. So what is this movie about? I've said a lot of things about sort of the way people have talked about it. I want to say a little bit about what I think it's about. Um, the plot is pretty easy to summarize, although it seems in some ways kind of beside the point. Uh, it's delivered in a fragmented way. At one point, it's sort of dumped in one scene. There's a lot of backstory that is just dumped in a kind of dutiful, here you go, here's the plot that you were looking for kind of way. Uh, but essentially, the plot is that an American doctor named Shane, who's played by Vincent Gallo, travels to Paris on his honeymoon with his young wife, uh, who's played by Tricia Visay. And he's looking for a guy named Leo, who's played by frequent Denis collaborator Alex Descartes. He's a French doctor with whom Shane was previously involved in some vague experiments in Guyana some years back. And Shane is seemingly in search of an antidote that has, uh, for an illness that has been plaguing Leo's wife, Coré, uh, who we saw earlier. And that illness seems to compel her to maim and to consume the victims of her sexual appetites to the point where Leo has started to board her in their apartment uh, before he leaves for work. And there's all sorts of fairy tale uh, analogs here, as well as some, some Jane Eyre, Mad Woman in the Attic type stuff going on. And as we learn early into the film, Shane is not really, he's, he doesn't just have an academic interest in this or a personal interest in this to the extent that he knows Corre. He's also exhibiting some of the same symptoms that she's exhibiting. So he's possibly in search of a cure for himself. And the only true innocent in this film, in the sense that she hasn't done anything to partake in these experiments as far as we know, is Shane's wife, June, who it's suggested early in the film uh, is possibly going to become a target of Shane's violence. He has a, a really foreboding, disturbing image of harming her that he can't seem to get out of his head. 
Suffice it to say, something happened to two of the characters in this movie before we met them, and they've changed. And that something has something to do with science and something to do with sex, which are de described in the film as being different kinds of pursuits of knowledge that are collapsed together. They're comparably pleasurable and dangerous. So like High Life, Trouble Every Day is nominally a genre film that you know, deals with some troubling territory. It also has a little bit of sci-fi in it, although I'm not sure a lot of people would, would really describe it as primarily science fiction. There are some beakers that people put mysterious fluids in, and there are some chopped up brains and some swirling centrifuges, but there's not a lot of hardcore science fiction in this film. Mostly it's what you would call either a vampire or a cannibal movie, certainly a monster movie, whatever nomenclature you might prefer. Um, I think it's one of the, the most interesting tensions in Denis's work that she's someone who frequently adapts the work of other writers while at the same time having an incredibly singular vision that's instantly recognizable as hers. She's adapted people like Herman Melville and Franz Fanon and Jean-Luc Nancy and Roland Barthes and lots, a number of other authors. But here her antecedents are largely, I think, in genre cinema. And she treats them in largely the same spirit, despite the fact that they come from quite a different place. So, for example, um, the extended take we get of Corey slinking down the staircase reminds me and has reminded some other people of uh, Max Schreck's staircase climb in Murnau's uh, Nosferatu, although it's sort of reversed in this moment. It's slow and it's sensuous and it's sort of in a a moment that this character has been fulfilled versus the way it's depicted in Nosferatu where it's a moment of anticipation. The horror is still to come. Denis is also clearly playing with Frankenstein throughout this film. Uh, we've got this other image from the same sequence I showed you earlier where uh, Gallo is clearly doing his best Boris Karloff and he's sort of joking and sort of not, I think. He's sort of acknowledging uh, Frankenstein and the Promethean myth as being sort of part of his own background as a scientist who's uh, had some dalliances in, in, in the dark art, so to speak. And I'd argue, even though this is a very dark image, you'll see it very early into the film. There's something in this image where we, we see Alex Descartes uh, embracing his wife who has freshly committed an act of violence against somebody. They're in the grass and he's being tentative and kind and gentle toward her. There's something about this image that I think provocatively recalls another image from Wales Frankenstein where uh, the monster is, is similarly in a natural space with a child, another innocent, the sort of the innocent monster and the innocent human with the child. And that, spa that space sort of being pregnant with meaning and pregnant with the potential for violence. As with her other adaptations, Denis is teasing out the threads here rather than making them explicit, rather than being heavy handed in the way that she traces them. She's brushing up against these texts in her own distinctive gestural and phenomenological language. And I'm drawing attention here to moments of tactility and moments of embodiment in this film because I think this is ultimately Denis' primary mode. If you've seen any of the films in this retrospective, then you've realized that Claire Denis is really interested in the body and in tactility. I think insofar as the movie is saying any one digestible thing, pun sort of intended, uh, about the body, it's that the human capacity for reaching out in tenderness and in yearning has its violent analog in its equal capacity to wound and to consume others. In this respect, I think the film is in some ways quite happy. It fits quite happily in the context of Denis' other work at the same time as it still feels quite shocking besides some of her other films. Her films revel in our shared embodiment as humans, I think, as a number of critics have pointed out, our capacity to know each other through touch. So what does it say then that the touching in this film is both sensuous and violent? What can we say about the way that Denis and her cinematographer, the great Agnès Godard, shoot the body in the same fragmented way, in the same sorts of extreme close-ups, where one body and one subjectivity blends into another, in these acts of violence as well as these acts of intimacy? 
Denise really famous for her dance sequences, as you might know if you've seen any of these films in the in the past few weeks. Um, you could think of Descartes dancing with the, the the chicken in No Fear No Die. You could think of Denis Levant dancing on his own at the end of Beau Travail. You could think of the the sequence in Thirty Five Shots of Rum, where the main cast is dancing to Night Shift. There are a number of examples of dancing as a way of sort of resolving narrative threads in her films. And I want to suggest that both the sex scenes and the killing sequences in this film are also dance sequences. They're variations on that motif. They're comparable sorts of set pieces to those set pieces. These pas de deux between two characters who, in their bodily movements together, somehow become one. And Again, I think these set pieces are allowing Denis to take stock of how people relate to each other. And in this film, I think she's saying that people don't always relate to each other in healthy or productive ways. So it's quite dark, but this is a sequence from one of the, one of the most violent and shocking moments in the film where we're seeing two people in a seemingly loving embrace that sort of seems parodic that are grotesquely tied to, I'm gonna rephrase this. The, the two faces here are kind of blurring together in a way that could be seen as productive and could be seen as positive, but ultimately as the scene goes on becomes a kind of obliteration of the other person. Desire here is sort of reduced to this moment of primal, uncivilized violence where rather than merging together, one subject blots out the other subject. And it seems to me that this shot and many others like it are rhymed with the same sorts of extreme close-ups that we get in the sex scenes that are tender and that are gentle and that are treated as being uh, erotic and generative and full of potential in a way that the other sequences are violent. In talking about her work on this film and particularly her use of these extreme close-ups of faces and segmented body parts, uh, both in the sex scenes and in the murder scenes, uh, Godard talked about wanting to be near the skin of her actors. She wanted, she said, to be so close that she could actually reach out and touch them. And she said this really curious thing when she was doing an introduction, not unlike this one, uh, for a screening a few years ago. She said, to take a photo of a wild animal, you either have to be very far from it or very near. Uh, and there's something about that that really makes me think of what Denis is trying to say here about this sort of ambivalent potential of coming close to something. I'm not trying to suggest here in closing that Denis and Godard are on some kind of human safari, that they're sort of marveling at the human in this way, but they are interested in thinking, I think, through this sensuous way of knowing about other people, about the ways in which the human animal relates to others like it and tries to get closer. Sometimes those gestures are gentle and humane and life-affirming, and sometimes I think this movie is saying they're the most monstrous things that we're capable of. I hope you enjoy this movie insofar as it can be enjoyed, and I hope you have lots to say about it afterward. Thank you.